Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Julie Delgado. Um, I use she and her pronouns. And I, um, I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the Vice President of the Urban League of Portland. Um, I've been at the League for 12 years, and I'm very proud of all of the work that we do. And I, I'm happy to introduce you to this panel. So um, I'm going to start with my boss and our fearless leader, Nikenge Harmon Johnson. She's the President and CEO of the Urban League of Portland. And then I'm going to introduce all of the other um, panelists. But we're just really thankful to all of you for coming to share your evening with us. And so. Um, let me just kick us off. So um, the Urban League of Portland is a statewide organization. We serve all of Oregon and Southwest Washington. We're a historic civil rights and service organization dedicated to and led by black and African Americans from around the state. Um, we, our work takes many shapes um, really in service to the community. So we have a wide array of programs, but one of the largest programs at the Urban League is our housing program, which does serve people on the gamut all the way from street level homelessness to home ownership. And then another really important in program that the Urban League is known for is our advocacy work, which is advocacy and civic engagement, where we do policy and legislative advocacy. And so this is kind of a marrying of the two, where we're talking about issues that affect the whole state um, from kind of a focus of how this policy looks on the ground. So um, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm going to read this so I don't mess it up, but um, uh, we, uh, indigenous tribes and bands that have been with the lands that we inhabit today throughout Oregon and the Pacific Northwest since time immemorial and continue to be a vibrant part of Oregon today. We would like to express our respect to the first peoples of this land, which are now present day nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon, the Burns Paiute tribe, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayaslaw Indians, Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, Conf Confederated Tribes of Silitz Indians, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, Con Confederated Tribes of the Warm Spring Reservation, Coquille Indian Tribe, Cow Creek Band of the Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. It's important that we recognize and honor the ongoing legal and spiritual relationship between the land, plants, animals, and people indigenous to the place that we now call Oregon. The interconnectedness of the people, the land, and the natural environment cannot be overstated. The health of one is necessary, necessary for the health of all. We recognize the pre-existing and continued sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribes who have ties to this place and thank them for continuing to share their traditional ecological knowledge and perspective on how we might care for one another and the land so it can take care of us. We commit to engaging in a respectful and successful partnership as stewards of these lands and encourage folks here today to take actions towards social and restorative justice. Thank you. Um, so I would like to start introducing our panelists. So I'm gonna start immediately to my left. So our first panelist is Lincoln County Commissioner Claire Hall. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. Uh, Claire has served with many organizations key to addressing housing and mental health, such as the Oregon Association of Counties Human Services Steering Committee, the Oregon Ending Homelessness Advisory Council, and the Governor's Council on Alcohol and Drug Programs, and she was its final chair of that um, council. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Um, next down, I'm going to skip over to Kenge, and then <laughs> next down the line um, is going to be uh, Sheila Stiley. Okay, correct, sorry. The executive director for the Northwest Host Coastal Housing, Sheila brings her decades of experience in the housing industry and partners with mental health providers in the region to expand housing access. Um, she currently serves as a board member of Housing Oregon, which is a statewide advocacy organization ensuring that all Oregonians have health, a healthy and stable place to live. Thank you. And then our, our final panelist today is Andrea Bell. Andrea Bell is the Executive Director of Oregon Housing and Community Services. So Andrea oversees the strategic vision, direction, and growth of the state agency that's responsible for providing stable and affordable housing across Oregon. Um, she's also served as the Director of Housing Stabilization at OHCS, and she led the implementation to a wide range of homeless services, energy, and weatherization assistance. So welcome, Andrea. <laughs> And now I'm going to turn it over to our president and CEO, Nick Nge Harmon Johnson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm still not taking myself off mute. Right. Okay. 
Uh, good evening, all. It's lovely to see you here today. Uh, and those folks who are watching um, on cable TV, thank you for being with us. Folks um, viewing via YouTube, via Facebook, we're always delighted to have you uh, with us and to the folks in the room. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Julia, thank you uh, for being our moderator. It's delightful to have uh, a vice president like Julia. She preceded me at the Urban League of Portland, so I inherited her. Um, but I'm proud to say I've been able to promote her three or four times. I don't know. Um, but I'll keep doing it because she's uh, excellent at this work and very committed to it. And it's um, rare that we're able to share a room, let alone a conversation like this. So thanks for making time to be here with us. Uh, I am Nikenge, and um, I'll say it again, Daddy, because I know you like to hear it. I am Nikenge Harmon uh, Johnson. Uh, my father, y'all, um, uh, and his wife are local residents, um, and so they've joined us this evening. I'm really glad to see you, Daddy. Thanks for coming. We certainly have other friends in the room uh, and colleagues, um, including uh, Blair Bobier. Hi, Blair. It's great to see you. Um, but I also I can't recognize everyone because that would be every single one of you uh, who has joined us. But I'm really glad to have you here. Thank you for um, for taking the time to spend time with us. Uh, Rep. Gomberg, it's very nice to have you here. Senator Anderson, it's lovely to have you here as well. Uh, Mayor Walkie, uh, we shared lunch earlier. I really want to thank and appreciate you for welcoming us uh, to your city and for taking time to talk with us about some of the uh, main issues that you're facing, um, both pro and con, uh, and the ways that we can work together for folks all across the state uh, to really make a difference um, locally, but also for the um, other Oregonians. So thank you for making the time, Mayor Walkie. It's great to see you. Uh, friends, why are we doing this? We are the Urban League of Portland, and we have been for 78 years. Uh, it's been my honor to lead this organization for a little over eight years, uh, but I grew up with this Urban League. It's two blocks away from where I went to middle school. Um, it's always been a part of my life in one way or the other, quite frankly, uh, and I'm really proud to have this job, but I tell you it's a different job every year. Um, it's, we ebb and flow to meet the needs of the communities that we serve, and the Urban League is like seven organizations in one. Uh, we don't serve or focus on one issue, we serve, serve a community, uh, and we ebb and flow to meet the needs of that community. Uh, when I started the Urban League those eight plus years ago, at that time we didn't have a housing program. Now, in prior uh, decades, the Urban League certainly did. Uh, we've owned dozens and dozens of units of housing and apartments and individual homes and all kinds of things, um, but that waxed and uh, waned over time. And so when I got to the League, we would refer people for services. They'd walk in the door and say, I need this. They'd call us and say, I need that. And we would refer them out to other partners, but they would come back because uh, other folks didn't have what they needed. Um, or they were turned away by other programs. And uh, at some point we said, well, I guess we're getting in the game uh, because no is not an answer that works to stabilize community. Uh, and we believed in ourselves and we believed in our community that we could help to meet the moment. Um, we also thought that there were cynical forces at work, uh, both in Portland and other places around the state, frankly, that are designed to pit communities against one another. Um, that there is just too little to go around, so some people are gonna just have to live outside because they're either lazy or they're dumb or they deserve it. We don't believe that. And I certainly don't believe that that's the Oregon way. So we decided that we weren't going to listen to those voices and we would uh, make ourselves certified smart people uh, and figure out how to do it. Now, I am lucky enough to work with uh, some amazing social workers, some community health workers, other folks just have a heart and a love for the work, but I'm a lawyer. I'm a businesswoman. This is not, uh, I don't come from this work from that place of service. I come from this work from a place of finding the resources and making the connections that allow the people who do the hands-on work to do more of it and to do it better and to be compensated appropriately for this really important and difficult work. Uh, and I just knew we could buckle down and kind of figure it out, but it would also take reaching out. It would also take engaging folks who are already at the table and doing the work so that we could become a part of the solution and not just one more voice at the table who thought we had something smart to say. Uh, we really wanted to be part of the answer. So as Julia mentioned, uh, our housing program is now, frankly, it's far larger than the Urban League used to be. Um, and we serve thousands of people a year, um, not just in the Portland metro area, but across the state, because in fact, we are um, a regional organization that serves all of Oregon and Southwest Washington. So friends, don't get hung up on the Urban League of Portland, Portland part of our name. Uh, it certainly matters to us because that's where we're rooted in our main offices in, in North Portland. But we belong to all of you. We're responsible to all of you. 
Uh, and your concerns and your needs matter to us, and it's our endeavor uh, to make sure that we're meeting the moment, not only through our direct services, because that's important, but you've got organizations right here already in your community who are doing the work, but also through our advocacy and our civic engagement. Uh, many of you have already talked to or met with um, members of the Ur Urban League's advocacy and civic engagement team. These are the folks who are professionals who track the bills in the legislature, who have the, count, uh, the com count of conversations at county commissions, who engage with community members to help them amplify their own voices on issues that are most important to them. And that's really where the Urban League can make a big difference on some of these issues because we talk to legislators every single day. We talk to uh, city councilors every single day. We talk to those folks who are making decisions about resources and where they should be and to solve some of the most difficult challenges that we faced. Uh, the context for this conversation, and I will turn it over to Julie in just a moment, is that housing, well, anytime you ask somebody what's the biggest issue in their community, it doesn't matter whether you live in Hood River, you live in Bend, you live in Salem, if you live in Albany, you live in Ashland, it's the same answer. Housing is the biggest issue. Whether you're a student, whether you're working, you're a family, you got kids, you're a business owner, Housing is the biggest issue. The lack of housing, the lack of affordable housing. Um, and as we continue to engage with community and listen to the Urban League members that are across the region, we knew it was important that we had these kinds of conversations face to face with you as soon as we possibly could. Uh, we started this series of community conversations virtually because we were stuck in the pandemic uh, and weren't breathing on each other. But we started having these conversations uh, in Salem, we've done this in Hood River and other parts of the state. Um, and the topic of housing has always risen to the top, and so we wanted to have that conversation here as well. Because while there's lots of sad news, and you know the stories and you know the concerns and you see them and live them every day, uh, many of you, but there's also lots of good news. One of the good notes that I will say just right off the top is that finally, and I do mean finally, because as a little girl in North and Northeast Portland, when housing was becoming unaffordable people in my community, people were, honking their horns and raising their hands and shouting from the rooftops about gentrification and other issues that were impacting uh, affordability of housing in Portland. But then it was just a black issue. It just happened to black people in North Portland. Then it was just a Portland issue. Well, you know, Portland and all of its darn problems. But the funny thing is, now it's a problem in Eugene, affordable housing. Now it's a problem in Bend. Folks who have lived in Bend for generations can't afford to live there anymore. Now it's a problem in Medford and Ashland. People who have grown up in those communities, including folks like my niece, can't really afford to be homeowners in the places that they're from. Now we've got ourselves a statewide problem. Why is that good news? Because now decision makers all want to come to the table to do something about it. They don't want to point and say, well, that's your problem. You've got to figure that out yourself over there on the coast. You've got to figure that out yourself over there in Portland. Now they're at the table talking about these issues together. Uh, they finally are meeting the moment. Um, so for me, that's very exciting news, and I want us to continue that momentum. So by being here to talk with you, to highlight this issue, to talk about the things that you already know are important, and maybe to bring some new ideas to the table, uh, we can continue to keep the ball rolling in positive fashion to meet the moment, to make sure that our neighbors, our employees, ourselves, our families, our friends, are housed stably uh, in the communities that they love and deserve to continue to remain in. So that's what this conversation uh, is all about. That's why we're here, uh, and we're delighted to join you. Thank you for joining us. Julia? Thank you very much. Um, so without further ado, I'll jump into our first question. So our question to the panelists, um, I don't know if I'm too close to the microphone. Um, the, <laughs> the question for the panelists is um, homelessness, you know, the perception of homelessness can really be colored by how, how visible homelessness is. And there's, of course, visible homelessness that we see in tents and RVs, but there's also hidden homelessness, people who are sleeping in cars, people who are doubled up or long-term unstably housed, families with children with no fixed residence, and many other forms. Um, and so one of the questions that we had was kind of about what tools do we have to measure homelessness and, and how are those tools effective? Um, so what are some limitations to our current systems for gathering data about housing instability and homelessness? Do our tools need to be improved to deploy the resources we need to address housing instability and homelessness in the region? And I'm just gonna turn this over to the panel and, and whoever would like to start okay. first. Yeah, clear. Well, thank you, everybody. Great to see so many familiar faces here. So let's talk about data. 
data is vital. Data drives decisions. And data on homelessness is a unique challenge for urban communities. Mm -hmm. Every county in the United States is part of what's called a continuum of care. This is a funding structure that was established in the 1990s by HUD, and it's driven the distribution of federal homeless dollars for years. Now it's beginning to drive state dollars as well. The continuum of care is in charge of the point in time car count, which I imagine a lot of you have heard of, but basically that seeks on one night to determine how many people are living unsheltered in a community. Now, Lincoln County and our neighbors to the east, Benton and Lynn counties, are part of a 26 county continuum of care, which does not have the resources to do mm -hmm. this important job yeah. in the way that is needed. And that has consequences. One example, the governor's executive order in January on homelessness brought almost immediate help to the 10 largest counties in the state. And then thanks to uh, Representative Gomberg, Senator Anderson and others, additional money was added for those of us in the 26 have not counties. So a lot of jargon and mumbo jumbo, but bottom line, what does this mean? For example, the director of one community action agency told me had Lincoln, Lynn, and Benton been a standalone continuum of care, we would have received 10 million in state dollars. We're actually getting 3 million. Now, 3 million is going to help. It's going to keep our momentum going, but obviously, 10 million would do a lot more. Yeah. So, you may be wondering, and yes, the three counties are now seriously looking at forming our own continuum of care. And if you look into the point in time count very deeply, you find even when it's conducted with good resources, it doesn't capture a lot of people. It doesn't capture adults and children who are living in inexpensive motels, campgrounds, and in their vehicles. It doesn't uh, cover people in encamp. Well, it should cover people in encampments, but that's difficult here. You know, in Portland, you're gonna find a homeless encampment under a bridge ramp. Here, you're gonna find them in the forest. I talk from time to time with somebody who is with the Sayus Law National Forest. She told me 10 years ago, they'd find a stray camper or two in the woods. Now they're finding encampments of 12 to 20 people or more. And I don't know how you capture that uh, in a point in time count. Um, let's see, I don't want to dominate things, but my big concern here is if we don't provide more tech support and ongoing support to service providers, simplify this work or both, we're going to continue to see this have and have not situation among service providers with those who do have the capacity to do the data work continuing to grow and the others being left behind. Thank you. Sheila, before you start, because I know you have a lot to say about this, um, I, you know, uh, for someone like me, um, and that's a good thing, um, uh, for someone like me who uh, came to this work differently, point in time count, it's like, oh, that sounds pretty simple, but for, just to make sure that everyone knows what that is, literally there's a day, mm -hmm. <laughs> one day. In January. In, in yeah. January, yes, this is important. Uh, where volunteers from all over um, are asked to come and count homeless people on the streets. You go to the park and you go to the bridge and I'll go downtown and you go to the, and get your clipboard and then and a one and a two and a three and then we'll come back and we'll put them together and then that is what the funding for this community will be based upon. Mm -hmm. It's ludicrous. And if there's bad weather and you don't show up, well then we're not counting at the park. And oh, whoops, uh, turns out your baby came early and so we're not counting there or not, you know, I'm, my bad. Um, <laughs> this is why you shouldn't point at people specifically where you have these conversations. <laughs> um, we'll be friends, it's fine. 
<laughs> um, but that, that is yeah. how we base these funding decisions. Uh, so what that meant um, in Portland was that the city of Portland said, well, black people aren't homeless, so no Urban League. The, the plan that you're putting forth to provide uh, services to help stabilize people, we know you don't need the resources, go kick rocks. Well, sure, they're homeless. We know that because they come to our office. But they didn't come on the day the point in time count happened, so they don't count. And there's nothing we can do about that. So we had to, from the ground up, be involved in the point in time count, which meant training our staff and training volunteers and getting people to show up and, hey, y'all, this is why it's important. And, hey, we're going to go not to the bridge and the park and that, but because our people aren't there. They're at a different park and they're in a different place. And indigenous communities face the same thing. Well, black homelessness looks different from veteran homelessness, looks different than youth homelessness. Those of us who do these kind of services know that, but the point in time count and the folks who are frankly responsible for making sure it goes well didn't seem to know that. Um, so Julie, you'll remember this number better than I do, but after we got in the game and were involved in the count, what was the rate of uh, uh, homelessness for black folks? That How much did it go up by? 53%. How much? 53% over a two year period. 53%. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly the people who the city said didn't exist were being counted by the folks who knew that they did. Mm -hmm. And then we had a problem that we could respond to with resources and such. I'd say that just to make it, it's really simple, but not necessarily that smart. Okay. Yeah. Sheila? Well, it sounds, if you all tell, we're a little passionate about the point in time count and how it <laughs> impacted us here, but um, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and in January, I mean, I think we anticipated 16 volunteers and we had just opened up our shelter and learning the, the new HMIS, mm -hmm. the Homeless Management Info System through the Community Services Consortium. And that's what tracks is through that system. And uh, our folks were supposed to be trained and they weren't quite trained on it. So even in our shelter, we couldn't even capture those numbers, and the 16 volunteers didn't show up. So we literally had two hours to go through with an application, to uh, an app on phones to try and capture that data. Um, so it, it really impacted us, um, and I, I feel partially responsible for that in all honesty, but I mean, it is what it is, right? 16 volunteers for how much, what area? All of Lincoln County, yeah. 16, and um, we were supposed to have six at our site, and they didn't show. So, I mean, that it did impact us, and that was really unfortunate. But the pit and time count is only one aspect. We have a lot of other aspects of our data that we try to capture for individuals, and I just want to read a few of them. So the McKinney-Vento system for our school systems. The, as I mentioned, the, the HMIS, Homeless Management Info System, that's tracked through our Community Action Agency. EPIC, which is a program that's tracked with our Samaritan Health Services. Um, and that's not even mentioning things like Reliatrax, that's tracked through um, substance use uh, disorder A&D qualified it, um, it, uh, service providers. So there's a lot of different parts, and I think one of the things that we need to be really um, clear about and a barrier that we're finding is not all of these systems talk to each other, and they don't capture all the data on all the individuals that are out there. Why doesn't it talk to each other, and why can't we share? Well, because there's something called HIPAA, and 42 CFR, mm -hmm. which is higher than HIPAA. And so because of those, we can't share. And, and let's, let's talk about domestic violence. I mean, th that's, that's a, another aspect. So we have a lot of individuals that are truly impacted and are, uh, that are homeless and are living in their cars or in shelters. And we're trying to find a way to track all of those together so that we can really capture what the true essence of homelessness looks in our counties. And we don't have a system and a mechanism to do that. And I feel like we need to figure out what that is. If it's out there, I don't know what it is, and 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 if it is if it does exist, oh my gosh, please share, yeah. um, and and that's really the space that we're in. We need to find that more coordinated system where we can truly capture the onset of what our county really looks like. Because honestly, it it, it was atrocious to see what the actual data came back as. Um, and, and it's just not reflective of the community that we are presently serving and all of my beautiful agency partners here that are doing that work know that firsthand. Uh, so we do need to find a way that's more um, holistic in how we do it, that protects individuals and, um, and allows that, that secured space where we can truly capture the appropriate data reflective of our area. So thank you for making the comments even because now I don't have to. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I'll add a couple things onto this. Well, first off, I just let me um, offer just appreciation, certainly for Urban League and leadership. Every time we convene a space, whenever we're in community to have a conversation, it always feels like the right conversation that needs to happen. And so I want to just acknowledge and appreciate the space and time here for this. So let me just have a little bit of just real talk conversation about data infrastructure and deficit and, and when it relates to that. It really it hasn't been until the last couple of years collectively as a state where we, we have really had in earnest conversations about data and about data infrastructure. And there was for a really long time, I would even go a little bit further to say, that wasn't always the sexiest conversation around data, around data infrastructure, dare I even say data justice and being able to really not only collect data, but also then begin to ask some questions about what are we taking away from that data and what, what decisions are we using to make that data. So that's one. It really is from an Oregon perspective statewide, collectively, just the last couple of years that we have begun, just begun, and, and I don't think that has been facilitated wholly by the state, that really has been where most of the progress has come from, which, which is really from a ground up perspective, to really talk about data infrastructure. And when I say data infrastructure, yes, it's more laptops, more people, it's all these things. It is also recognizing that particularly over the last couple of years under the pandemic where the word of the pandemic was unprecedented. Everything was unprecedented for all of the wrong reasons in many ways. But I think what we also found was that some of the solutions actually were not that complicated. And I think what we've continued to hear, certainly at a state level, is being able to prioritize more resources for capacity. And when I say capacity, not strange, rigid resources uh, named with capacity, but being able to really at the state level not only have uh, and come from a place of abundance with capacity, but also making sure that we're facilitating opportunities where communities have agency to deliver those resources as they need them. And we should always expect that even with the point in time count, we are naturally starting at a deficit. It is not telling uh, a full and complete picture. And I think when we then layer and center uh, race and rural communities over that, there's a lot of that picture that we're missing. And what I would just say, and then I'll turn it back to you because I think data is a, a hot topic. Um, we also know that from a federal level, which is where point in time count standards are really pushed from, progress is possible at the federal level. We also know it doesn't move the quickest. And so some of the solutions that we've begun to see, particularly in rural communities over the, oh, as it relates to data, has really been from community, community conversations, really pushing for the change that they want to see to be able to tell that fuller picture. And also, quite frankly, get more resources to, to um, make progress, shared progress. Thank you, Director Bell. Yeah. So I think this is actually a nice inter or transition because data is also something that informs our next question around mental health services. Oregon, data points that Oregon is near, ranks near the bottom of all 50 states when it comes to substance use disorder treatment and mental health treatment. This routinely occurs in Oregon. Um, we have a lot of different measures for this, and we're just near the bottom in all of them. Um, Data also shows that even when accounting for economic status, um, people of color receive worse treatment um, in, in all um, systems of health care. So that leads to significant mental health and substance use needs that are unmet in the community. Um, some other kind of drivers of that would be here in rural coastal Oregon, rural and coastal Oregon. Services are spread out over a very wide variety. We learned today about the public transportation mm -hmm. system here and how negligible it is. Um, treatment facilities are not available. There are language barriers. Um, staffing challenges are huge in, in this industry. And, and um, so there's high turnover and unstaffed positions. And so there's very little success. So that's my prelude. <laughs> and then the question for the panel is, how do the, how do the systems of care for mental health and substance use disorder, how, how do those systems impact how we fund programs to address homelessness? We'll start with Claire. Well, first off, I'd like to offer thanks and kudos to Governor Kotak for identifying housing, homelessness, and mental health as three very significant interlocking pieces of this larger intersectional uh, puzzle. Now, you hear people say all the time that the mental health system in this country is broken. It is, especially if you're poor, or if you're BIPOC, 
or if you're LGBTQ, if you're not a native English speaker, if you're in a distant rural community, if you're mobility impaired, in short, if you're part of any group that is marginalized by this society. So here in Lincoln County, we've got all the challenges uh, with building a mental health system that you hear about in most places. Inadequate funding, chronic workforce shortages, the extra challenges for marginalized populations that I mentioned, but I am seeing some glimmers of hope. Now, there are some people in this room I've had some spirited discussions with, for example, about ballot <laughs> measure 110, and that has been let's just say a bumpy rollout, but yet it is starting to bring new dollars into the system, important new dollars. Also, a kudos to Samaritan Health uh, Services. They, are, they have a property and they're making plans to open up an inpatient drug and alcohol facility here in Newport, and I'm sure they'll be serving a lot of dual diagnosis clients as well. The $1 billion Medicaid waiver that the state received from the federal government last fall is really exciting, I think. It is the first time ever anywhere in this country that the feds have okayed using uh, Medicare dollars for housing and food. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that this is also going to bring about some better integration of housing and mental health. Now. Permanent supportive housing for people who are severe and persistently mentally ill. This is an important need, and for too long, frankly, here in this county, we have lagged behind other communities, for example, our neighbors to the north in Tillamook. We've only had nine units for people with severe and persistent mental illness, but Recent changes in leadership in health and human services in the county are helping make a lot of good things happen, including putting together a funding package to build a new 20-unit uh, mental health complex in Lincoln City. So, my thoughts? I appreciate that. Um, very nice to see you. Thanks for coming, RJ. Uh, I'll say uh, briefly, uh, first, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Aaron Scar from Tillamook County, thank you for being here. It's lovely to have you. Um, I also want to recognize uh, Urban League of Portland board member uh, Margaret Carter, the Honorable uh, Senator Margaret Carter. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and my beloved mommy, the number one Urban League Aww. volunteer, thanks for coming, Mom. I love you. Um, Uh, it's the great thing about this job, it really is a family affair. Um, and these are the folks I you know, learned uh, from to be passionate about this work. Um, I will say that you know, to be a state that has so many challenges, um, we are also quite innovative um, in meeting the moment and meeting the day. And it never fails that when I have a conversation with either Senator Merkley or Senator Wyden or uh, Congresswoman Bonamici, um, and I meet with them at least a couple of times a year, they talk about the, their efforts to help change uh, or pull the levers uh, at the federal level to allow Oregon to meet um, our challenges in a way that we can start doing that today rather than later. Um, there are other states that would find themselves, we're, you know, we're, we're 49th or 47th or 50th, um, but there's a real uh, drive, a real desire by folks here on the ground to make that be different. And there's some other folks that you know, are, are neighboring us on that list um, that might not have the kind of leadership that we have at the federal level uh, to do anything about it. Um, but every day uh, we lose seven Oregonians uh, to uh, alcohol and drugs. Yeah. Every day, seven. When I say it out loud, it hurts my feelings because we're not that big of a state, right? Seven is too many if you're California, but we're not California. Um, so these are people that are missing from our homes and our classrooms. They're, as an employer, people who are missing uh, you know, from the workforce. Um, they're missing from our churches and our communities, and um, many of us recognize that and want to make it be different. I'm really excited about the waiver because I think we can do something special, and I also think that um, some other folks will follow us, which should help build some momentum so some additional changes can happen. Um, so I'm excited about that, but it also really sort of tears me up um, that we find ourselves starting from such a disadvantage. Um, there are folks who need to live inside because that's the only way that they're going to have a chance to get better. 
Um, but beyond that, even people who are not able to receive the kind of treatment that would help them be on the road to stability for a lifetime, living inside will help them to be better. It's not very complicated. I'm quite certain if I lived outside, my mental health would deteriorate very rapidly. The experts tell us so, but our common sense also tells us so. Um, it's not that big of a leap. So even as we're trying to find additional resources um, to help people um, with dual diagnoses, with help people with um, various mental health uh, or addiction challenges, we have to find a way to help those folks live inside stably, even still. Um, even without those additional resources. And that's part of the challenge that I know we face in every community, um, but it's one of the pieces that's most frustrating for me. So. Yeah, thank you, um, because they've, they've touched on very similar topics. I mean, we're feeling it from the ground. Uh, these, these are really impactful moments without having the mental health services just on the ground to be able to assist our individuals who we are presently serving. Um, um, many, many of our individuals suffer from different levels of mental health as well as uh, addictions as they're trying to self-medicate themselves through some of this process. And let's be clear about mental health today, right? Mental health has changed a little bit. Uh, we're definitely seeing it. We're seeing individuals where they've gone through some pretty major trauma. They went through a wildfire. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've experienced um, you know, losing their homes. They've experienced other crises, uh, fractured families. Um, we're seeing a lot different mental health traumas and crises now showing up in folks that I don't think we saw before. And, and to compound that issue so much further, we have a lack of mental health professionals here in our area to be able to assist those that truly need it. The wait list is long, uh, so funding those positions isn't really that big of the issue. It's actually, uh, where's the housing that we're gonna put them? And some of the systems too, we, that still need some correction. But it is a process that we are working through, but we just have to acknowledge that this is a real issue. And if there is one thing I can say out of this is if we can change the paradigm thought process about what mental health is today and how that reflects into our homeless population right now, uh, we're, we're looking at it and that's it. Um, it it's, not the, it's not the veteran that's mm -hmm out on the, in, in, out in the woods because that's where he chooses to be. Um, yes, we have those. But I, I'm here to tell you it, it, it's not the large, vast majority of it. So I am hoping that with our, our funding that we can have through mental health, I mean, there is this gap. So we are trying to infill that gap in the meantime. And how do we do that? And we're trying to bring together different agencies and meeting people where they are in our shelters instead of having our individuals through a 72 mile spread county meet people where the county services are. That, that doesn't work when you don't have transportation, you're homeless and you've got kids and you're trying, you know, and all of these pieces and they have to use the, the bus system. What was it, three times goes through Newport? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just unspeakable. So we need our partners and our agencies to be that infill in that gap as we're trying to deal with that mental health. I'm sorry, but I, I really believe it's housing first. Yeah. I mean, that's the world I'm in, um, and I see it firsthand. So, you know, once you have the housing, then you have people who can actually receive their medications, and they can get stabilized that way. They can receive their prescriptions. They can get the medical care. Uh, Samaritan Health has been wonderful in bringing their, um, their nursing staff to us and assisting in our three respite rooms and our shelters. That's a time of commitment that we need, and that's the type of support that we need in order to infill this gap of the mental health that we don't presently have here. So. I feel like we should provide more services to support our own agencies to address some of this mental health. QMHAs, uh, Lori Lager with Reconnections Counseling is training her staff right now to be able to have that qualified mental health Associate, there we go. Um, but those are critical. Uh, they're important pieces to help people get around. That affects the mental health of an individual. Um, so we, we, we desperately need, I just wanted to bring it to ground level of what this does to affect us. These are the more larger, more holistic things that we can get that they have spoken to. And can I just say waiver 1115? <sighs> like, yeah. yeah, I'm excited about that one. So um, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. So you took it to the ground level. I'm gonna pull us up in altitude a bit here. So, um, so I'm really appreciative of this question because I think it was said on the onset around 
um, some of the very real challenges that we know that we have. And I also want to offer uh, sort of a place of abundance in terms of what is the actual progress? Because I think we know that we want to pursue progress. I think for many of us in our communities, we know clearly the progress we want to see. I think there is also this larger question of can we make it happen? Can we actually make it happen? So very briefly, back in 2018, we said we wanted to create 25,000 units of affordable housing by 2024. To date, we've created over 26,000 across the state. We said in rural communities we wanted to increase the pipeline of affordable housing in rural Oregon, specifically rural Oregon, by over 2,000 units. To date, we've created over 4,000 units, all of us, shared progress here in rural Oregon. To the earlier point around permanent supportive housing, we set out, we made a promise collectively to change the game with permanent supportive housing and create at least 1,000 units of permanent supportive housing. We've created over 1,400. We're now at a place in the state of Oregon where we have achieved something that very few states have, which is not only do we have a waiver, which I know doesn't sound like the most exciting conversation in there, but let me tell you why you should be excited about it for wherever you're listening to this, because it is for the first time allows for Medicaid compensable services for rental assistance, meaning Medicaid is a covered benefit. Medicaid is a covered benefit for rental assistance for Medicaid eligible populations. We also have for the first time an increase in pre-tenancy and tenancy services. So when you think about somebody, as somebody, I'm gonna take us back just a little bit. So when I was a service provider, it's not just getting somebody housed, it is being able to earn trust, being able to engage all of the upfront move-in cost, and then when they get in housing, that's often where the real work and where the real journey support starts. So we've talked about health and housing being vision, mission aligned for Oregon. We've said here the reason why we're in this room today is because we don't accept homelessness as a fact of life, right? We don't accept housing instability as a fact of life. So the question of whether can we achieve progress, we've done that as a state. Despite and in spite of all of the very real challenges, we have made progress. But I also want to call us in collectively that with this waiver, we have some very real opportunity and part of our role and responsibility in this is to make sure that we are sharing the power and shared decision making. That is gonna be a critical piece of not only part of where we've going, it's also been part of the deficit in how we've done things, I think, sometimes. Oftentimes, as a state, we have done things where we've decided it and then defended it. And I think the only way forward, because we know that we have some concophony of challenges that we are facing and we are in a resource benefit environment as well. We came out with over one $1.1 billion in housing investments. And so now we need to have $1.1 billion worth of housing progress that are reaching communities. And I would just call us into the opportunity and the shared accountability from a state perspective, from a local perspective, to engage in that uh, in a way that we haven't uh, before. Thanks. And I'm going to be rebellious. No, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's hear it. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things that you that you touched on. I mean, first of all, I, I just want to give you a little background. So, since 2002, our agency has the nine units of dual diagnose mental health and addiction housing here in Lincoln County. So we have that work under our belts, working directly with mental health. And I will tell you, having that housing stabilizes individuals when you're bringing those supports in, right? Um, the permanent supportive housing, our agency will be the first one. We're bringing three online. We just broke ground in our veterans complex. So that's coming to Lincoln County as well. Thank you. But we can't do that alone. And Honestly, it's the mental health dollars and it's the mental health support that really does help assist these individuals in bringing them out of that space. So we, we do need to be able to have that continued monetary support that comes to our housing developments. This 20 units is a great start. I'm not done yet. Um, you know, and, and, and we have a lot more to do, and, but we really need to have those continued supports and those agencies to come to the table to make it happen, because we might build it, and that's great, and yes, housing first, but we need to surround up with those funds and those supports to make it actually happen and to stabilize and stay, stay, stay housed. Our average amount of time that we have an individual in our place at our nine units is five to 10 years. On the street, five to 10 years, aging in place, and we've been able to have the privilege to do that. That's what housing does, and that's what services do when they're combined together. 
Thank you. And I'll, I'll be rebellious, too. I, um, I moonlight as a professor at Portland State. I teach a course on homelessness. And one of the things that I always ask my, tell my students, I repeat it over and over, so I'm going to repeat it to this room, is that housing is a, is a vaccine, right? But it's not health care. So, so you need that vaccine. That's your stabilizing factor. But these services, that's your care. And so they really, housing first, you need to be vaccinated, you need that. But then, um, you know, not, not last. <laughs> yeah. and just, so, so another transition, I like the way these questions flow so nicely into each other. So then, then um, one of the issues here on the coast it has a, a unique um, kind of landscape in terms of housing affordability and the ability to build housing on the coast. So there is a lack of workforce housing available. So I'd like to invite the panel, this is our last question, um, how does the limited availability of workforce housing impact this community's, uh, overall community's ability to address mental health? How, do, how are these services performed if there's not enough workforce housing? How are we dealing with that? The impact is negative. Yeah. Okay, I, I, you'd probably <laughs> like to hear me elaborate on that a bit, but uh, yeah, for a long time, uh, um, we have had a problem in this county, not just with uh, low income or affordable housing, but workforce housing for professionals. And yeah, that's a big impact on mental health services among many other vital community services. You know, recruiting people to careers in rural areas can be tough. Rural life isn't for everyone, though I'll point out the window and say, you don't know what you're missing. But, you know, often professional couples, uh, say a mental health professional and a nurse, if they're looking to come to a rural area, if they can't both find kind of satisfactory positions, they're less likely to come here. But housing, well, I'll bring out one of my favorite stories. It's getting a little dusty. This might have been 10 years ago or so. But in Lincoln County, mental health, we had someone in a supervisory position, you know, a good position, probably earning $80,000, $90,000 a year. After nine months, he turned in his notice. Why? Not because he didn't like his colleagues, he loved them. Not because he didn't like his clients, he loved them. And he loved this community, as any sane person would. <laughs> but uh, he said he was tired of moving his fifth wheel from campground to campground while fruitlessly uh, searching for a home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for uh, those folks who are watching, we have the, the sounds of the ocean right outside the window here. Uh, we're right on the coast. <laughs> um, we can hear the waves in the room, li literally. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because the Urban League's, you know, our main office is in is in North Portland, as I mentioned. Well, uh, when I was a kid, I you know grew up in this neighborhood and would walk by the Urban League every day, uh, you know, on the way home from middle school. Um, we, yeah, I, I grew up right there. My friends lived there, and Urban League employees lived in the neighborhood too. Many could you know walk uh, right to work. Now, most of my employees live more than a hundred blocks away. Mm -hmm. If they're lucky, um, th we live in Salem, we live in Woodburn, we live in Silverton, we live in Vancouver, we live in uh, uh, the place that I can't remember right now, um, but past Gresham. And when I say that, I mean folks who, right, let's pick, pick places, um, Fairview, uh, Hillsboro, um, and some of these folks do their work in person in North and Northeast Portland. They would like to live closer to the HQ, but they can't afford it. It's simply not possible. So the, the, the need has, hasn't changed and the work uh, hasn't changed, but where my employees are able to afford to live, even with the good wages that we are now proud to pay at the Urban League, it's just not possible. They're competing with the doctors across the street at Legacy Emanuel uh, for the same kinds of housing. Um, that's a very different thing. Now, we are fortunate in that the Urban League has grown a great deal um, 
certainly in the past a few years, but in the last decade, and we serve a multi-county area. So not everyone has to come to the mothership every morning to do their jobs. Beyond that, we've been able to morph into a, a, a somewhat remote uh, job-based organization. And so rather than coming to the mothership to you know, check in and do what you gotta do, tell you what, you're 100 blocks away? Well, your clients and program participants are also 100 blocks away. So you've got your laptop and you've got your smartphone. You can uh, you know, sign in for the day there and then go straight to your client's home without having to come to the mothership because I don't want you wasting that time. We got things to do, um, but also you don't want that kind of job because man, that, that's, you know, that's no fun. Uh, but it does certainly impact our ability to hire and retain the folks that we need to hire and retain to do this work. Uh, and there's not much that we can do to make that be different. But I often say that at the Urban League, we are who we serve. Uh, the issues that we work on every day related to affordable housing very much impact my workforce. Um, we're you know, firsthand um, aware of the, the concerns that our program participants um, face. Uh, and it's not getting any better. I'll say this and then I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let one of my co colleagues speak, but um, when I started at the Urban League, we were, you know, those first couple years, we had some folks who were retiring, they'd you know, been there uh, for years and whatnot, and we needed to hire some new folks to replace them in some really uh, key leadership roles. Well, uh, for example, in one role we were paying about 45,000 bucks a year for a senior role, someone who'd been doing the job for, I don't know, let's just say a decade. Well, the person I had to hire to replace her had student loans more than $45,000 yeah. and didn't own a home and didn't have a spouse that offered health insurance and didn't and didn't. I can't pay the new person $45,000 to do that job. And I certainly can't find someone with 10 years of experience, right, to pick up where the senior person left off to do that job, not for that number. Mm -hmm. So it meant something very different for us as an organization that's seeking to serve community, but imagine having that conversation with funders. Whether it's the state, well, why do you need so much more money now? Because you weren't paying us enough before, and the person who was doing it before could afford it because they bought a house 20 years ago, lucky for them. Mm -hmm. But that's not happening these days. Yeah. So I got a different set of situations to deal with to try to fill the same needs, and you're gonna have to belly up to the bar with me. That's a conversation that we had to have again and again, both internally for ourselves, just fixing our eyeballs and fixing our brains, but also externally to have folks understand that we're in a real marketplace for talent. And people who wanna do this work need to be able to afford to do this work and they need to be able to live in the place where the work is done. Uh, we're still having that conversation uh, many days, but I just wanted to make that really plain. Um, some things have changed and many of them um, not for the better, but our ability to be a flexible employer has made all the difference in our ability to succeed, but there's a limit to that. Yeah. Some of these things have to be done in person and can't be done any other way. Some of these things have to be done in an office and they can't be done any other way. Um, and even for an organization of the size of the Urban League, that's a, that's a reality and it's a real strain. And we've, had, we've certainly lost some wonderful employees and great talent. Um, not only had they left the Urban League, but in some cases left the state oh. because they can't afford to do the work that they love uh, here in the place where we need them most. So it definitely has a huge impact. Yeah. Thanks for the question. I mean, my, our story is no different, um, obviously, with, uh, with the lack of housing. Now, okay, just, so I've been doing property management going back to 2002. So I did affordable market rate housing for seven years. And it's the same story today as it was then. There wasn't enough housing for our workforce. I can't tell you how many nurses, how many doctors, how many dentists, how many mental health counselors, and you name it, all of the professionals have always had a challenging time finding housing here. It's just exacerbated now. Uh, in, intensely. And uh, I, I do believe that we've got sort of a, I think we're caught in what I call a Velcro loop, so to speak. So we, we have our affordable housing that we try to assist people to the good past their barriers, to increase the point where they can possibly become first time home buyers, right? And we need the people to move on to be first time home buyers so we can clear out the space for the other people to come in. And you know, so this, and we need to have the housing that they can buy so that they actually can move on. You need to have the workforce housing that's there so that people can get out of the affordable housing and into the workforce housing that they don't qualify maybe now for anyway. So it, it's a lot of this continuous cycle. So what I am just here to say is name a niche that we don't need housing in right now. 
I mean, truly, name a niche. Um, and I'm trying to address as many of them as I possibly can, and it's a really tiring, challenging job. But without our workforce housing, it does create create a, a real challenging problem. So what we're what we're having to do is the same thing. I mean, we're having to look at uh, at teleworkers. So one of my employees I hired, she lives in Lebanon, and you know she has to commute here twice a week. But we literally do a lot of this work for housing from the space of another community, right? And that's uh, thankfully for uh, COVID in a little bit. Okay, don't take that the wrong way. But <laughs> if there was a positive to come out of that, us in the rural areas were always kind of accustomed to having to talk remotely anyway through cell phones and things because of the distance and so I feel like for us rural areas the rest of the state caught on um, and so it opened the door a little bit for us to be able to start spreading what our availability was and in individuals I mean it, it's been a little different we really wanted to have people inside to do that but really truly it's opened up the door of who we can have in our area I don't know if that's something that mental health can do I know that they are trying to do that with virtual calls which I appreciate but housing is still a problem here. It really is. And, and one of the key things we were talking about today over lunch is without the housing, I mean, do you know how many jobs it takes for an individual just to be able to pay their rent? Some individuals are working three jobs just to be able to make the ends meet. And, and then they have their spouse or their roommate who's doing the same thing together just to be able to make the ends meet. And guess what? They're not making the ends meet. And so we're losing our stabilized individuals that have been here for our generation. Both of my children have just moved to Iowa. And I'm gonna be a grandma. And they're in Iowa. Because they couldn't find a place to live and they couldn't find the jobs here in Oregon to support them. And so I'm impacted personally. And I know other people that are here feel the same way and are also impacted. It's just such a trajectory presently where Oregon is, and without this housing, affordable housing, and workforce housing, and I know it's a workforce housing question, I'm in the world of affordable housing, but, and sheltering, um, but I also believe in, in workforce housing. We do need all of the above, truly, and, and it directly impacts, I think, the landscape of what our county and our communities here in Oregon, what they look like. I really do, and, and as an individual with Housing Oregon, and, and I've, I've been the chair of that now for the last five years, and I won't step off until I know rule is, is impacted and has a voice at that table, I will tell you that much, because we need to have a voice, and it took us too long to get it, and I don't want it lost, right? And we're all experiencing the same thing. Uh, and, and we're not alone, do know that, and, and everybody. The only, the only difference is what I tell people in the year, don't buy a house here for the first year, experience our climate and then make a decision <laughs> because it, it is a different way of living um, and that is another reason why we do shuffle through individuals here too so just so you are where there are all these pieces and I just yeah. wanted to give a moment to again spread out just a little um, I'll offer very quick comments and then I'll yield to you, uh, Jennifer. Um, so I'll just say one thing. So whether it be workforce housing, middle income housing, uh, I wouldn't get too caught up in um, terms. I think what we're talking about, the real talk, what we're talking about in terms of middle income, it is that middle squeeze. It is where you earn too much money to be eligible for many of the services, um, and then you were considered to be too high income for other things. And I think the reality is, is that middle income experience has expanded here in Oregon. I think very similar to probably your experience, there is uh, not a month that goes by that we don't hear from frontline workers and teachers around the need for affordable housing. We talked a lot about health and housing. I would just offer and submit that we brought that to also be the economy. The health of our economy has always been based in making sure that everybody has access to their basic needs. And it turns out we are much more inextricably linked than we ever thought. So when somebody is struggling to get by here in one part of the coastal community, that's not just a loss for that community, it's a loss for that state. And that is very much tied to, directly tied to uh, the health of our economy. And so all the more reason as we talk about affordable housing, medical, medical, uh, middle income housing and certainly health and housing and access to and who has access to um, I think that is a key indicator for the health of our uh, state and so I think we've got some opportunities in front of us to change that trajectory thank you so that concludes our questions for today I just want to do one more thank you to the panel thank yeah. you director Bell thank you, Sheila, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And then I'm gonna turn it over to Nikenge because we have some community champions to honor. Uh, as I transition, um, I'm going to ask Madam Chairwoman uh, of Housing Oregon, uh, I sit uh, as a board member on Housing Oregon as well, um, will you just say a, you know, a few words about Housing Oregon, let folks know who it is, who we are, what we do, while I shift over? Yeah, I'd love to. So Housing Oregon has been around for, I don't know how many years, but a very long period of time. <laughs> Right, um, And I will tell you, one of the key things about Housing Oregon that I appreciate, operating in the field of affordable housing is really a siloed industry, and it's a challenge to understand. And there isn't a training module that you can go through to understand it. And why it, what I appreciate about Housing Oregon is it's provided that space where individuals like myself, I feel like that's where I got schooled, uh, mm -hmm. through these, these, these conferences that we've been able to have, these industry support conferences, and really, they are the advocate that to be able to assist in all of the individuals in the affordable housing realm take on some of those legislation components and really be a, a real inference on making sure that we make an impact and a difference by hearing the voices that are that are representative around the state and I've made a real push and forgive me y'all for saying this but as rural Oregon I have pushed and screamed and kicked and thrown my I, I threw a fit um, but I want to make sure that that rural is represented in that we are heard. I cannot say that enough, but it, we were just too silent and not heard for so long that um, I don't want to lose the momentum. And, and it took Housing Oregon to realize it was between six and 13 years between a rural area would actually be funded with a, a, a notice of a funding application from OHCS. And that's pretty tragic, right, in our rural areas. So this is a space where we want to train up agencies. This is a space where we um, want to inform our legislators. This is a space where um, we need more voice Voices to come to the table from individuals that have interest in legislative change where it comes to housing advocacy and where it comes to affordable housing. So I'm really, it's, it's been a, a real blessing for me to be a part of Housing Oregon and to meet partners such as Nikenge. And, and it's been a great space for us to meet other individuals, come together and see how we can partner to really be successful in developing future housing projects throughout the state, so. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and we've got a conference coming up this September 14th. Oh, no, shame that's on you. wrong. 26th 26. through 28th. Uh, oh, I keep getting it wrong. Um, so check us out online. We'd love to have folks come. There'll be people from all around the state talking about housing, housing issues. Some of our elected officials will be there. Um, so more of this um, with more folks um, who are really passionate about uh, these issues. Uh, thank you. I really wanted to make sure we shared a little bit more about Housing Oregon. Um, but at this time, we're going to transition um, to the next phase of our program. And I want to take time to honor some of the folks we've talked about who were doing the work locally. One of the great things about being the Urban League is that we're a convener. Um, we have the ability to bring folks um, to the table who are already doing the work, but don't necessarily have the resources that we do to amplify the work um, or to take a minute to, uh, to pat themselves on the back. Um, we love to show up in community uh, to be able to share some of that applause, uh, quite frankly, and to make it really clear that while the Urban League does this work and we're passionate about it, and frankly, we're very good at it, we've got lots of partners across the state that are also quite good at this work too and they deserve your time your attention your donations your support um, all of that so um, this is where we highlight a community organizations and it gives us an opportunity to lift them up so uh, we've got three tonight that we're going to focus on um, I'm going to start uh, and I think I'm going to ask one of my team members to stand in in just a second um, but let's uh, recognize the Olala Center um, one of the things that we do when we are uh, bringing community conversation to various communities is do site visits. Uh, we like to visit and see with our own eyes um, some of the things we've heard about. Phoenix Rising, I drive by it once a month. Um, but, it able, it, but it's a different thing to be able to actually hear from the folks who are doing the work. Um, it's a different thing to actually go to Olala Center and see what's happening there, and uh, we were able to do that today. Um, the Olala Center was formed in 1978 with a commitment to providing community-driven, community-based services that support the holistic health of individuals, which in turn supports the health of the community. Uh, Olala Center accomplishes its mission through mental health services, community programming, and providing spaces where underserved community can really be met and served in ways that will lead to their stability and their ability to thrive. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. They focus on the unique heritage of their participants. And uh, 
that's something the Urban League does as well, and we're really proud to see that happening uh, in this community. The Alala Center uh, is a member of Juntos en Colaboración. Uh, it's a group of individuals who work together with members of uh, the Hispanic and Latine community and with uh, indigenous community members as well uh, to provide services that are culturally specific um, and that help to make the community stronger while increasing access and the resilience of those same programs. Y'all, this work is hard. And it's even harder when you're trying to serve people who are already underserved in so many other ways. So we want to um, applaud the Alala Center. I know um, Alex um, was going to be here uh, to receive the award this evening, but car trouble happened. Uh, so Alex, we're still giving you love virtually. We know you're out there watching. Um, we thank you so much for all that you do and for uh, allowing us to visit you um, earlier today. It means a lot. Thanks a lot, Alex. Speaking of Coastal Phoenix Rising Project, uh, second up, uh, we want to recognize uh, that work. Um, prior to the establishment of this turnkey project, um, shelters followed a rotation model uh, where organizations aiming to provide assistance would house participants in various locations, um, when and where and how they could. Uh, Coastal Phoenix Rising offered a set site, a location, a place where participants can receive shelter and services um, while they're in crisis and then to help them stabilize thereafter. Uh, this was only made possible by communal efforts. Not one person, not one group, not one time, by, by a group of right-thinking folks who came together to make it happen. Um, and so we want to honor Coastal Phoenix Rising Project. And Sheila, if you would please uh, come on up say a few words about the project, and receive your award. <laughs> well, Nikenge was right. I mean, it really took a, a whole slew of individuals coming together, and um, it, it, it started off with our wildfires. We had two vacant units at our Ridge apartment complex in Lincoln City, and I wanted to place our displaced people there. And I was told, you can't do that. You can't put them there because you put your entire project at risk of non-compliance. I don't like being told no very well. Um, so when this, this came up with this project turnkey concept, and I was approached by both Commissioner Claire Hall as well as uh, Commissioner Katie Jacobson, and I think it was 13 days we were joined at the hip. Yeah, about that, yeah. Uh, getting that turnaround put together and getting our community supports. and. Oh, we did. We broke Be the, the Rebel Now. Oregon Community Foundation handled the grant applications for Project Turnkey and made the decisions on awards. And Sheila and I, in that very intense week and a half period, singularly or together, we went to every organization here, including we probably dug up a few we weren't aware of. but. You had to submit the application through a single portal on their website, and they called Sheila and said, okay, you broke the portal, you can do it in two pieces, because we had so much support. I forgot about that, but if that doesn't talk about our solidarity in Lincoln County, I don't know what does. And so we, we truly couldn't do that without our partners, my board members, um, our, all of our letters of support, our agency huddles where the commitments that we have from our agencies to show up week by week by week to do this program, um, being fluid in the process, identifying what we need to change and model. I mean, it's just, there, it, it's a lot to it, but we're so grateful for every single person. We could not do this alone. We have literally served over 357 individuals since our doors opened back in May of 2021. So we're very pleased and we're grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Nikenge. Thank you very kindly. I'm going to walk away with this. You can't walk away with that. I have to have it back. Dang it. Um, so, I mean, you know, we're still a nonprofit. No, um, you're, <laughs> no one leaves until these are paid for. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, pass the hat, Stephanie. Um, we're actually going to ship you your very own. It's going to be all engraved and inscribed perfectly, so you don't have to trot around with it. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, next up, <laughs> next up, um, let's talk about uh, Samaritan House. 
Uh, as we've learned this evening, um, homelessness comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes and people from different backgrounds and um, Oregon finds itself uh, at the bottom of the list um, or maybe at the top of the list, depending on how you look at it, um, for in lots of different ways and unfortunately including for youth homelessness. Um, the, the number of students and folks under the age of 18 in our state who are homeless and who are hungry, by the way, it's both, um, is really astronomical and it's not getting any better. Um, it's frankly very heartbreaking. Uh, youth houselessness is high and we need solutions for our, to keep our youth and our families housed. Uh, Samaritan House provides shelter, education, and resources for houseless families with children. Uh, this is the kind of work that we want to uplift. Um, this is the kind of work that we encourage you to support, both with your dollars, um, but as well as your time. Uh, so uh, Lola, Lola Jones, if you would please come up, now that we're besties, <laughs> and say a few words about the work, I'd certainly appreciate it. Thank you. This is what your award will look like. Oh, I'm, huh? Future me is impressed. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, it's actually really refreshing to listen. Um, people know in this room I do a lot of talking. <laughs> it was really hard to keep quiet tonight, but it was a really, really wonderful exercise um, because it gives you new perspective on the work. You know, we were just talking earlier uh, today about how kind of that interruption of the daily grind um, is really welcome. And the daily grind is hard when you work with people that are experiencing the kind of vulnerability that we are, um, especially if you are brave enough to be close to them, if you are brave enough to share humanity with them. And there are a lot of people in this room that shared a lot of humanity with me <laughs> when it's come to working with clients. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's, there's an element of restoration and justice in giving families the opportunity to be together. It's a little radical. So um, that's where I'm feeling the intersection of mental health and housing today. Thank you all for being here and for the award and the appreciation. Yeah. All right, here we go again, Sheila. I'm going to tee it up for you. Uh, I think the two of us certainly, and I know everybody else would like to say a big thank you, especially, well, thanks to everybody for being here, but two folks especially. I'm, I'm so grateful for our legislators that really fought to bring all of these, process. thank for all of you that are here tonight and your hard work and dedication that you have really put into all of the bills that we've passed. My goodness, it has been uh, a, 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 a tremendous win that we have seen over this last, especially this last legislative session. And we just want to say thank you so much for your advocacy. Betty, thank you for your support as, as Toledo City Councilwoman. You have been tremendous in that small community. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for all of our people we've had here. So hats off to you guys. We couldn't do it without you, so thank you. Claire? Oh, gosh. Uh, Lori Lager, Reconnections Counseling, anybody who lives here, works in this realm, knows what a dynamo she is. Karen Rockwell, the Executive Director of our Housing Authority. I hate to do this because I know, who am I leaving out? I'm, I know Lucinda. I'm leaving, huh? Lucinda. Lucinda Ulrich, our Director of our Habitat for Humanity chapter. Amber is here from my sister's place, our Domestic Violence Services and Shelter. You snuck in a little late, Amber, but, and all, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, otherwise I would have seen you there in that corner sooner. Bad on me, not on you, bad on me, but, uh, who, Promise. Elizabeth Reyes, director of the Family Promise program here, and a whole lot of other folks, it's just amazing. Uh, Director Bell, would you like to uh, make a few comments before we wrap up? Uh, you know what, just an abundance. Uh, abundance of gratitude again to Urban League, quite frankly, for just for continuing to do all of the things, uh, I think, for holding the vision for what's possible. Uh, for all the folks for being here, whether you're tuning in uh, virtually or, or not, just excited for what's possible for the state of Oregon because of all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Julie, I'll kick it over to you in a moment. Um, I really want to thank our community champions. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for allowing us a chance to lift up your work and to celebrate it. Um, 
It's been an honor to have you with us today. Uh, I also want to thank RJ Navarro, uh, a friend and a neighbor from Kaiser. Thanks for being here with your family. It's great to see you. We've got folks from Kaiser and Tillamook and Portland. Um, that's what these communication, community conversations are really all about, is bringing folks um, together, both in person but also virtually. Uh, we like to take uh, questions from the audience when we can. Timing didn't work out this time, because we just have a lot to say. It's all there is to it. And we're not going to keep you here all night. Um, but on your way out, the folks in the room, um, we have dinner for you. There are bags. You pick one up. Uh, it's part of the Urban League values that we bring people together. We also feed you, and it makes these uh, events more accessible. You don't have to decide whether to make dinner for your family or to come out to engage um, in civic engagement. It's one of our uh, core values. So please do not forget to grab uh, one of those bags. Um, for the folks who are listening online, uh, thank you for making the time uh, to be here with us. For the folks who are at home, um, we have more of these community conversations that will be taking place all around the state. I think our next one is scheduled for Pendleton in September. We will be there to let her book again this year. Um, it's a great time and we're really very excited about it. Um, as I take my seat, I want um, you folks to know that we had lunch with earlier, the folks who we were able to meet this evening, that the work you do in community is vital. Um, our state is in crisis and it's hard to live in crisis, uh, but you do it and you give back to your communities in ways that um, are frankly uh, impressive but also very necessary. Um, the Urban League sees you. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, we know uh, that sometimes it feels like we can't win, that we can't get there, and the folks who should be helping us don't help us enough sometimes. We understand it, and I want you to know that we're in your corner, we're on your side, um, and when we or can be of use to you um, in some way, do not hesitate to reach out to you because we belong to you. The Urban League is, in fact, for all of us, um, and we have been for nearly eight decades now. Um, I'm Nikinge Harmon Johnson, and it's been my pleasure to be with you. Uh, Julia, if you would please wrap us up, I'd certainly appreciate it. So I just want to give one final thank you to our panelists, um, my, my boss, president, and CEO, Nikenge Harmon Johnson. Um, <laughs> Director Andrea Bell of OHCS, Oregon Housing and Community Services. Uh, Sh Sheila Stiley from Oregon Coastal Ho Housing. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Northwest, Northwest, I'm sorry. I knew that. <laughs> and then Claire Hall, uh, Commissioner from Tillamook County. Lincoln. Lincoln, oh my goodness. Okay. Guys, I really need the note cards. I really needed them. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about Tillamook County. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, right, well this continuum of care. My, uh, okay, so I also just wanna thank um, um, the Urban League of Portland staff that made this event happen. So that's Jennifer, uh, Miles, Stephanie, and Crystal. And I just, this is a wonderful event. Uh, thank you. I, 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 w I want to thank all of the folks that care enough about our community and about our state to come here on a, on a, on a beautiful evening um, to engage about this really important issue. Like the, the only way we solve these problems are, are together. And so just I appreciate all of you for being so civically engaged. It's wonderful. Um, I want to thank uh, Open Signal for live streaming the event, um, LNS Captioning for providing captions on the live stream. And I want to thank the Chinookwins uh, Casino and Resort for this beautiful space um, and for catering the event. And I want to thank everybody who joined us online. Uh, and the last little plug that I'd like to give is that the Urban League of Portland is actually a membership organization. Um, so we thrive and survive through, through individual supporters who kind of put their money where their mouth is, that they believe in the mission of the Urban League of Portland and they would like to join us in fighting the good fight for a more just and equitable place to live and work. So if you're interested in becoming a member, we highly encourage you to visit our website at ulpdx.org. Thank you.